Hey there! In this video we're going to continue our examination of real estate concepts in architectural terms and continue with open concepts. There are dozens of spatial concepts from architectural history and theory that could be considered open, and in the first video of this series we looked at Frank Lloyd Wright's organic architecture. If you haven't watched that video yet, consider giving it a go, and while you're at it, consider showering this video with likes, and if you're into thinking more about buildings and architecture, hit the subscribe button and I'll grace your eyeballs with brand new videos every week. Anyway, Frank Lloyd Wright's brand of open concept was motivated by attacking the box shape of the room and arranging rooms so that they overlap their corners, creating a series of diagonal connections between them. The absence of a singular line dividing individual spaces of each room makes the floor seem more continuous than it would normally than if you were thinking of a building as a collection of box shaped spaces. In this video, we're going to take a look at free plans, which are different than either organic plans or open plans for that matter. The nature of a free plan begins with the architect Le Corbusier, who is fascinated by segregating buildings into elements that provide structural support versus elements that are there mostly just to divide up spaces. While columns and grids of columns existed well before Corbusier, he was one of the very first to really elevate their status as an architectural concept, and he was so fascinated by this way of categorizing architectural elements that he created a drawing that shows a building stripped from all the elements which are purely to divide up space. The drawing is called the Maison Domino, and it had a significant impact on architecture, and it illustrates some of the ways that Corbusier saw architecture. The name is a kind of double entendre, or Le Corbusier was very, very clever that way, and it comes from the Latin domus, which means house, and it also alludes to dominoes, which references the repeatability and the seriality of things like the floor slabs. The drawing depicts something that is not really a building yet. It's more like a seed for a building, caught midway during the construction process. It doesn't show all the things that a building needs, but it's a distillation of the essential components of concrete construction, a technology that Corbusier was wrestling with to use in a domestic application. And the drawing shows just those parts made of concrete, the columns, the stairs, and the multiplied stacked floor slabs. This is in contrast to Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, where walls were often built of stone or brick and did most of the work for holding up the building. Corbusier was motivated by this shift from structural walls to structural columns. While none of his finished buildings look exactly like this prototype drawing, it offered a series of lessons that he took away while designing his buildings. These lessons are rules that one can follow that lead to a building that expresses just how well the building can facilitate the needs of modern activity and showcases the difference between the parts of the building that were to hold the structure and those that were to divide up the space. You may have heard of these five rules or five points of a modern architecture, but in case you haven't, I'll use Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie to illustrate them. Bonjour, je suis Villa Savoie. I have long, beautiful windows and beautiful slender columns, which makes my free plan much more than an open concept. I also have a beautiful hat on my head, open to the landscape far and wide. The first are piloti, or columns that appear to hold up the second floor of the building, while the first floor is recessed. This showcases the columns as one of the first things that you see in the building, and it expresses the lightness of the architecture. Also, Corbusier was interested in weaving together domestic life with automobile travel through architecture. The piloti lift the building to allow the car to snake underneath and on the ground floor to enter the garage on the other side. This softens the experience of arriving by car as the building welcomes its mechanical inhabitant. Not only is the ground floor rethought in Le Corbusier's five rules, but the roof as well, and the second rule is the inclusion of a roof garden. Since the roof is just another repeated slab, it's a flat floor for the outside, so one could treat it like a manicured part of the landscape. In Villa Savoie, the space includes a composition of ramps, planter boxes, tables, and walls with cut-out openings, and all of these provide a scripted relationship between the inhabitant, nature, and the architecture, and are made possible through the expression of this modern conception of building. The third rule for modern architecture is that one should design a free plan. Since walls are mostly there to subdivide space, and columns are there to hold up the floor slabs, walls and columns don't need to be in the same place anymore. Columns are arranged in a grid, but not in an even grid. They have a direction or a grain to them, and even though the overall building shape is square, the columns offer a directional subdivision pattern. They don't go all the way to the edge on one side, while they do on the other. 
They also shift away from the regular grid for various reasons, like accommodating the ramp in the middle of the building. The columns aren't arranged in a purely structurally efficient distribution, because if they were, they'd just be in a regular grid. So there must be some other architecturally significant motivations for where the columns go that modify the expected regular grid. Other roles for columns that help Le Corbusier locate them in space include showcasing them as sculptural objects on display to be admired. Also, the columns are sometimes deployed to create subdivisions within rooms themselves for zones of different activity. Yet another role for columns that dictates their location and spacing is their role in creating visual spatial understanding. As in the Eurasuree's house, for instance, columns are spaced in a gradient from near on one end of the building to far on the other, accelerating your sense of depth and space. The fourth rule of designing, fourth, fourth rule of designing a modern architecture is to have a free facade. The outside boundary or the facade doesn't hold up the floor anymore in this kind of architecture, so it can stray away from the structure as well. In spaces like the living room, the facade is placed directly on the other side of the structural columns. It's floating free from the structure and is distinguished as separate from it. In the second floor roof terrace space, the facade continues around the square shape of the overall building, but the dividing line between the inside and the outside is more complicated than that, and the roof terrace is within the footprint of the building and behind the facade, but still outdoors. So the facade is freed and it is deployed to find new ways of dividing up space and vision. Finally, the last rule of designing a modern architecture is to include a ribbon window, which is a window that is stretched horizontally. If the facade did hold up the weight of the floors above it, windows would be narrow to minimize the removal of structural material. But now we are free to make windows in shapes that seem to defy gravity by making them long in the horizontal direction. The free plan is also marked by a strategy for moving through the building that Le Corbusier calls the Promenade Architecturale, which is a scripted path of movement that curates a series of views that are framed by the architecture. In this sense, the building is treated like a movie set with a roving audience. Some views are aimed toward the inside and some are toward the outside. In my video about nine square grids, I showed the plan of Le Corbusier's Villa Stein. I compared it to a plan by Andre Palladio and I mentioned that the Z shape of the interior is a modern interpretation of the X shape of the older building. It's a dynamic path with no singular destination. Frank Lloyd Wright was also interested in diagonal movement, but here it's a little bit different. Le Corbusier's buildings have an outside shape that's relatively clear and unmodified. In the two houses that I've shown so far, they've been either a square or a rectangle. And then this shape is then subject to three primary subdivisions. One is the structural grid inserted inside. Number two are the walls that subdivide up space. And then three is the architectural promenade that weaves through these elements in a scripted fashion in order to understand the story of the architecture and its surroundings. A Corbusier building is not designed from the inside out in the same way that a Frank Lloyd Wright one is. The window types of each architect also offers clues about how they were thinking about space differently. Frank Lloyd Wright had the corner window, which I said projects you out into the landscape and your view changes relative to your position of the window. With a Corbusier's ribbon window, we get a frame that cuts off the top and the bottom of the landscape, focusing your view on the horizon into the distance. This is a view that many people, no matter where they stand, will have just about the same view. Their experience is not individual or dictated by an individual position. So a free plan is fundamentally different from an organic plan. A free plan is defined by a simple outer shape, punctuated with columns, slabs that are fully articulated, walls that slice up the space at will, and a scripted movement path that points people to look out and through the building in specific ways. So that's it for my take on free plans. Stay tuned for more videos that break down open concepts and other features of the built environment. See you later.